Good morning or good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets on Monday the 16th of October and this quick look at um, the week beginning well looking looking ahead to the key events this week and there's quite a few we're certainly coming back off um, record-breaking week for equity markets first before I get started and talk about them let's let's make a make a start with the risk warnings which are obligatory for compliance purposes um, so you know we'll, we'll look at we'll look at um, the record highs that we've seen in equity markets over the course of the past few days and look at and look to the possibility that we're probably going to see further gains albeit on a fairly incremental basis I certainly don't think that we're going to be aggressively aggressively pushing to the top side with with any great degree of force but what I think we will be seeing is in the, you know with the lack of any significant drivers it's, it's hard to really sort of make a case for a, a sharp decline in equity markets you know, I got asked this question last week ultimately given what we've seen over the past few weeks given the rallies that we've seen in equity markets and despite all of these concerns about North Korea um, a whole host of other factors that could undermine uh, the move higher in equity markets they've removed they've, they've proved to be remarkably resilient and last week's Fed minutes do appear to suggest you know with last week's Fed minutes do appear to suggest that um, ultimately uh, the US central bank while it still remains on course to raise rates in December I don't think there's any clear degree of certainty as to why um, they would increase rates by more than say two or three times in 2018 and I think one of the key reasons for that is uncertainty about the makeup of the Fed board um, and the FOMC at the beginning of next year let's not forget that there's no guarantee Janet Yellen will be re remaining in post beyond January 2018 Stanley Fisher the Fed vice chair is already gone so um, or is on his way out um, so he won't have any uh, won't have any input towards Fed policy going forward and there are four or five vacancies on the Fed board um, heading into 2018 and so until we get some sort of clarity about um, what that Fed board will look like in terms of hawkishness or dovishness I think it's going to be very difficult to establish with any degree of certainty what US monetary policy will be in 2018 yes the likelihood is we probably will get another rate rise in December and certainly I think the bond markets are reflecting that uncertainty but if you look at the overall direction of the dollar and this is something I talked about the payrolls webinar um, earlier this month I talked about this inverse head and shoulders on the dollar index and at the moment it does appear that the US dollar does appear to be carving out what I would call a little bit of a base but certainly in the context of where we are here on the dollar index if we look at say for example this left shoulder here and then we've got a potential right shoulder here and we've got the head here and a neckline here around about 94.20 if we look at that neckline at 94.20 it roughly equates to euro dollar of around about 116.70 and I talked about this when we talked about non-farm payrolls earlier this month there was a big big support around about 116.70 on euro dollar and a 94.20 resistance on the dollar index and I think when we're looking at euro dollar you have to absolutely have to look at dollar index because 57 percent of euro dollar is dollar index so there is a significant um, balancing effect taking place with respect to that now if we look at the left shoulder on the dollar index it currently comes in around about um, 92 92 and a half that sort of area which roughly I think when you work it through euro dollar probably comes in just below 119 and that's pretty much where euro dollar topped out um, at the end of last week at the, and and it's probably near 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 the highs around about this week so it's around about 118.70 so I think for a move on euro dollar and the US dollar overall we need to be looking at these two levels the 94.20 on the top side a break of which would signal further dollar upside and further euro downside or um, 
the right shoulder around about 92, 92.40, 92.30, around there or thereabouts on the dollar index, which will sing, signal further gains in euro dollar back to the highs at 120. So let's look at it from a euro dollar point of view. There's been a number of factors that have contrived to put downward pressure on euro dollar, and we've, we've seen some of them over the weekend. Um, the loss, um, the, the the regional election loss of Angela Merkel's CDU party to the SPD is going to make it much more problematic for Angela Merkel to form a brand new coalition government in a fairly speedy manner. I think the earliest we can expect some form of Jamaica coalition, if you like, is probably January 2018. And that means that ultimately any German government is likely to be a fairly weak one. Uh, and ultimately they're not going to be they're not going to be able to be particularly flexible when it comes to further Eurozone integration. And there's been an awful lot of chatter out of France as a result of that. And I think what that means is that we're going to continue to get the muddle through um, in terms of Eurozone politics that we've seen over the course of the next over the course of the last five years. We've obviously also got Spanish constitutional crisis as well. So Spanish constitutional crisis um, and the Catalonian the Catalonian standoff there. I think basically the, the Catalan president, Carles Puigdemont, is doing his best Vicky Pollard impersonation in terms of he doesn't want to make a decision. He's going, yeah, but no, but yeah, but I haven't called independence, but I might have called independence, but I don't want to make a final decision because you might, you might come and arrest me. And if, if, if I do declare independence, that's probably what will happen. Um, it will please my own side, but ultimately it will, it will result, I think, ultimately in the fall of the Catalonian government, new elections, and really then it's a question of how those get implemented. Do they get instigated at the, at the behest of the Catalans, or do they get implemented at the behest of the central government in Madrid? So I think further, I think further deadlock there. We've obviously got the Brexit deadlock as well. Theresa May flying to Brussels to have dinner with Jean-Claude Juncker. Well, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that particular meeting. I'm, I would imagine that's going to be very, very interesting indeed. But ultimately, I think in the wake of Jean, Jean sorry, I'm getting me Frenchman mixed up. In in the wake of Michel Barnier's um, admission last week that um, the Brexit talks are deadlocked, ultimately, I think it was always unlikely that we get any progress at the October EU summit, which is due later this week. Um, but ultimately, I think we could get some movement on the subject of trade because ultimately, irrespective of what the EU say about trade and the divorce, um, when it comes to the Irish border, the two are interlinked. And I think that's important. If the EU don't move on that, then it's to suggest to me that they're not serious about arriving at a deal because ultimately, the type of bill that is paid with respect to the Irish border will be directly correlated with the type of trade relationship that you get. Um, you know, if you have a completely closed border, then ultimately it's going to be that much different to maintaining an open border, maintaining single market access, and maintaining the status quo with respect to the customs union. The, the bill, the final bill, will be different. And the EU really do have to acknowledge that if these trade talks um, and these divorce talks are going to move forward because money and trade Ultimately, there is a distinct cause and effect correlation there, which the EU really um, would be, you know, a little, a little uh, would be wise, wise to sort of bend on. So, with respect to euro dollar, we've got a nice top here around about, or a nice resistance here around about 119.10. And again, what we've got here is a potential head and shoulders reversal. We've got the left shoulder here, we've got the head here, and we've got what looks like the beginning of a potential right shoulder forming. Here now we could easily break higher towards 119 up through 119.10 towards 120. It's not something the ECB is certainly would welcome, but ultimately it's something that could well happen. But ultimately, what this chart is telling me is completely different to what the interest rate correlation is telling me with respect to the spreads between, say, for example. Um, European two-year bonds and US two-year bonds, and it's the same sort of thing as it is for example the, the for, for for US treasuries I just showed you the wrong chart there I'm trying to find the right chart here let's look at this one here so we're going to look at the spread differentials between US 10 year 
US two year even, US two year treasuries. So we're going to find them. And this will give you an indication as to why I think euro dollar is too high. Because at the moment, what we've got is US two year yields, and at the moment, they're around about 1.5%. Now, if we compare them with German two year yields, there usually is a decent correlation in terms of the exchange rate movement between the two. But what we've got here is the correlation has broken down because this is where euro dollar was in February March it was around about 103 104 when the correlation between the two-year US Treasury and the two-year German Bund was at its highest level for quite some time that correlation was completely broken down we've got euro dollar at 120 or near as damn at 120 and we've got uh, two-year yields in the dollar's favor of around about 2.238 percent so there's something not right there. there's something really significantly undermining the US dollar and it's not really hard to figure out what when you actually look at the state of politics in the US. And at the moment, the dollar's lower because ultimately the US administration wants it lower. They don't want a strong dollar. And a weak dollar is what's helping push, obviously, US equity markets higher as well. Hopefully, you're following me at the moment. So in terms of where we go to next, it's a little bit undecided with respect to where the dollar's going at the moment. We're range bound. And until such times as we break with respect to the dollar index, either up or down, or we break out of the euro dollar range that we're currently in, it's going to be very, very difficult to establish where the dollar goes to next. But what I would suggest is it's unlikely in the short term for it to strengthen quite considerably. And that is why dollar yen has found it very, very difficult to rally with any significant um, with any significant um, aggression, because ultimately we are still in a range. Now, I've just been asked why, what the correlation is between dollar yen and the dollar index. And honestly, there really isn't that great a correlation because the, the yen only makes up around about five, between five and 10% of the overall dollar index. It's a very, very small amount. Um, and as such, the correlation is fairly weak. Now, there is a better correlation between the dollar yen and the Nikkei 225. And the weak, a weaker yen is obviously fairly good for Japanese stocks. And obviously, that is why when the yen has weakened since September, and gone from 108 to 113 we've seen the Nikkei at its highest levels in 21 years so whenever you get a weak yen you usually get a strong Nikkei and vice versa so ultimately I think there's a better correlation between the dollar yen and the Nikkei than there is between the dollar yen and the dollar index simply because the yen is a much smaller component of the dollar index having said that when you do get bouts of dollar strength they do tend to generally get manifested in the dollar yen more than say for example any other currency but for the time being we're in a range in dollar yen um, the top of that range is anywhere above 113.20 113.30 we're probably looking as if we could drift lower on dollar yen uh, and that would that would sort of tie in with a slightly weaker dollar scenario over the course of the next few days where the yen also suffers is when equity markets go risk off so um, essentially you will have a risk sorry when when you have risk off the yen strengthens and the dollar and the, and the dollar weakens is what i meant to say so ultimately the yen becomes a bit of a safe haven play in episodes when you have risk off and as a result dollar yen generally tends to drift low so while equity markets are going higher generally the dollar tends to strengthen against the yen and we certainly see we certainly see, we've seen that in the past couple of weeks with the dollar yen rallying from the lows of 108 but at the moment to try and pick a direction on dollar yen is very very difficult to do because we've been stuck in a range for so long now that the, the sensible trade with respect to that is to just play the overall range at the moment what we're looking at i think for the dollar yen is for it to drift back down probably to around about 111 111 30 um, because that's pretty much been the way of it for most of this year and I, at the moment I really don't see any evidence that that is going to change certainly in the context of central bank policy going forward so hopefully that will answer your question moving on to the pound because the pound despite all the concerns about a Brexit deadlock has particularly against the dollar more than anything else has held up fairly well we can see that with respect to the price action so far 
this year. If we go back to January, the pound is up against the dollar line about 7.7%. So um, for me, that tells me that the trend overall for sterling is up, irrespective of the political headlines and all the political shenanigans that are going on at the moment, the shambles that is the Brexit negotiations. Ultimately, if you're a trader, you trade with the trend. You don't trade the politics. The politics for me are largely irrelevant in terms of the price action until such times as I see some evidence of a price breakout. And what this is telling me ultimately is the trend for the pound is up against the dollar. So that suggests to me a slightly weaker dollar, and that sort of does bear in. That does that is supported by the way the spread between the two-year UK gilt and the two-year US Treasury is going. The interest rate differentials at the moment are pointing to a, a fairly decent decent rise 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 in sorry that's the uh, that's the UK that's the Q that is the UK EU I'm not paying attention to what I'm looking at it's the UK German spread so UK UK two year gilts are outperforming quite considerably German bonds and that should be broadly supportive of the pound particularly against the euro um, over the course of the next few sessions and I think that's probably why we started to see a little bit of sterling strength euro weakness it always helps if I actually look at the uh, actual graph to see what I'm actually looking at so I apologize for that that I was looking at the spread differential between UK gilts and German bonds two-year bonds so UK two-year gilts and UK and, G and German bonds and that really sort of supports this particular move that we saw at the end of last week and have seen since we saw the peaks in euro sterling in late August. We've been trending lower, we rebounded just above the 200 day moving average, but what we've seen here is actually quite significant. We tried to break back through the two through the 50 day moving average, this resistance level through here. But what was more important, and this was something that I paid particular attention to and made a note of in my morning note, was this key reversal day right here this really big negative down candle here so what we've done is we've gone we've traded higher from the lows that we saw in September we pushed higher here made a brand new high weren't able to consolidate it and closed below the lows of the previous day so that's a key reversal it's a key day reversal a bearish engulfing day whatever you want to call it it's a very negative sign because it's tried to make new highs wasn't able to consolidate them and closed below the low not only of the previous day but of the day before as well which suggests to me that ultimately the current upward move in euro sterling has probably run its course and we and we could well start to drift back down as long as we stay below this resistance line here so at the moment that line comes in around about 89 around about 89 which is basically equivalent to this peak here and here now I would build in a little bit of fat to that. So I'd say the resistance levels around about 89.10, 89.20. So while we're below 89.10, then I think the downward move that we've seen from the middle of last week is likely to continue and we could well head back towards the 88.20 level. So for me, this little move here has changed the game a little bit in terms of the rally off the lows and we could well be set for a move back down. Now if it goes back above 89.20 then stop out and reassess it but ultimately given what we've seen here um, the, the, the way that I would trade this would be to sell into strength uh, with a stop loss above the previous highs. Um, so going quickly going back to the sterling theme again and it's important that with respect to the pound what we've got to look out for this week because we've got a big week of data notwithstanding obviously the political risks and everything else we've got a big week of data which starts tomorrow we've got UK CPI now UK CPI the Bank of England has been very concerned that inflationary pressures are starting to become much more entrenched and we can look on the market calendar for that here these are the numbers that we're looking out for UK CPI looking for an increase to 3% now the Bank of England does not want that to go to 3%. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England, does not want to write a letter to Philip Hammond 
basically saying, sorry, Chancellor, you know that rate cut I did last year? Well, it's actually pushed inflation back above 3%. How stupid do I look? Um, he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to do that, but I have a feeling that he may well do. And if that number does come in at 3%, then I think it makes it that much more certain that the Bank of England will push rates up, interest rates up, base rates up, from the current 0.25% to 0.5. In other words, reversing last week's last week's last year's um, rate cut. Now, will that be negative for the pound, or will that be a mistake on the part of the Bank of England? Well, depending on who you talk to, I don't think um, putting rates back to where they were just after the June referendum, the June 2016 referendum, is the end of the world. If you look at where um, UK government bond prices are, they're pretty much back where they were when base rates were 0.5%. So moving the base rate back to where it was um, prior to last year's August rate cut, to my mind, won't make any difference whatsoever. All it's doing is correcting a mistake that was made 14 months ago. So, and ultimately has has helped actually drive inflation to a higher level than it would have been if they'd done nothing. Because I think it's debatable as to whether or not the pound would have actually gone as low as 119.80 um, at the end of last year. Um, in in the wake, and earlier this year, in the wake of last last year's rate, rate, rate cut. So, looking for CPI, but more importantly, um, we've also got um, CPI out of the EU, but also we've got wages data out of the UK. And this particular item is something that I will be particularly keeping an eye on. Economists are est estimating that inflation wages, wages pressures will probably decline. Um, I'm not convinced. I think there's potential that wage, pre wage pressures could actually start to increase. Um, certainly the the forecast is for a decline from 2.1 to 2%. We shall see. I'm not totally convinced about the accuracy of ONS data at the best of times. So I certainly think there are wage pressures starting to build in the economy. And ultimately, I think what we won't want to see is wage pressures starting to decrease because that would appear to suggest that maybe the Bank of England is making a mistake. But um, we shall see. We saw wage pressures coming at 1.7 in May this year. They have now jumped to 2.1%, and I still think there's potential for us to go even higher from there. So the wages data will be important, the CPI data will be important, but what will also be important tomorrow is testimony from the two new policy makers on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, David Ramsden and Silvana Tenreiro. They are the two. They will basically be voting for the second time um, on the Monetary Policy Committee. But more importantly, we'll get to hear from them about their views on the UK economy. We haven't heard from either of them um, as to how hawkish or dovish they are likely to be when it comes to monetary policy. We'll also get to hear from Mark Carney as well. So, you know, the big question, I think the big thing that I'll be looking for Mr. Carney is to whether or not the bank has cold, gone cold on the idea of pushing rates up between now and the end of the year. Obviously, the November, we've got the inflation report as well. So the favourite at the moment is for rates to go up in November. It will be a significant, I think, surprise and be bad for the Bank of England's credibility if they do not move on rates um, by the end of this year. And if they are going to do them, the best time to do them will probably be in November when they publish the inflation report. So it's a big week for the pound. We've also got UK retail sales on Thursday and we've also got public sector borrowing. So in terms of the pound, it's going to be a big week. Looking at this particular chart here, there's a significant resistance area on the pound around about 133.20, 133.30, but decent support around about the 50 day uh, about, around about the 100 day moving average at 130.20, which was the non farm payrolls day low. But overall, I still remain structurally bullish on the pound against the euro um, and against the US dollar. Moving on, um, looking going to be looking at uh, the German DAX now. Quickly look at that because ultimately we've all broke, we've broken to the top side. On pretty much all the major indices, 
and ultimately I think while we remain above this key support level here which was a which was the area of recent highs then ultimately the the outlook continues to remain positive but we can still drop fall all the way back to 12,900 but while above that I think it's very much a case of buy the dip it's pretty much the same for the S&P 500 we can see that too there that um, the outlook continues to remain positive so looking at here around about 2540 we can see that it, it looks fairly positive there um, got asked about Canada yen I will quick I will look at that right at the very end just make a quick note of that Canada yen and I'm being asked about platinum um, is platinum closely correlated with gold mm. the thing with platinum is that it's an industrial metal as well as a precious metal so you're going to get an, an, a little bit of crossover between the two what I would say with platinum at the moment we've seen this decent bounce but ultimately I'm not convinced as to how much more it's got to go when it turns when it comes to the next resistance level if we look at this if we look at this level here I've slightly misdrawn that but if we look at this low here it also co it coincides with the 200 day moving average so at the moment with respect to platinum we're moving into a very significant resistance level and the same is as true for platinum as it is for gold we can we can see a similar sort of move unfold here and this is obviously correlated with dollar weakness but if we look at what gold prices have been doing since the beginning of the year they have been trending higher so ultimately with respect to gold prices we've got decent resistance around about 1310 uh, and that's likely to be the case so in terms of looking at gold prices I would be looking to again buy weakness as opposed to buying strength because if you're buying strength you could actually be buying the top of the rally and it could actually start to drift back is there a correlation between them absolutely there is but you've got to be very very careful because the drivers of gold and the drivers of platinum in the same way the drivers of palladium they are different they are precious metals but an awful lot of say for example platinum and palladium have industrial use that say for example gold gold doesn't have to the same extent and one of the reasons that we've been seeing I think a rebound in prices in terms of commodity prices has been a rebound in palladium prices a rebound in copper prices and a key uh, and, and a bit of a rebound um, in oil prices and that is fueling inflation repression now Janet Yellen over the weekend the head of the Fed suggested that she was concerned about why inflation continued or was continuing to look fairly benign when it comes to say for example the US economy not so much here in the UK but there are exchange rate effects to take into account there but also in the European Union but one thing I have noticed I think with respect to inflation is that last week US PPI numbers were much stronger than expected this morning um, Chinese PPI numbers were much stronger than expected and they tend to be leading indicators of future inflationary pressure and if you look at oil prices if you look at copper prices and, uh, and this is this is a key case in point here we've got a strengthening oil price here it's broken to the top side it's still below the peaks that we saw in September but ultimately since June we've been in a fairly decent uptrend if you look at the Bloomberg commodity index if you look at the Thomson Reuters CRB index they've all rebounded strongly from the lows that we saw in June so there is inflation starting to build up in the system and that suggests to me that ultimately while central banks are puzzled about the weak inflationary outlook ultimately it's probably coming and it's probably coming as we go as we get into 2018 the big question is is how much can producers absorb that inflation as opposed to passing it on to consumers because at the moment consumers I think remain very price sensitive and as a result you may find that if say, producers raise prices you may find that that actually chokes off demand for consumer products so um, you know that's that's the catch-22 situation but certainly with respect to Brent we are moving higher um, and that's likely to manifest itself into a similar sort of move with respect to West Texas and we did see a decline in the rig counts 
in the US at the end of last week. But we are approaching a very key resistance line in, in WTI in the same way that we are with Brent, closing on the September highs. So keep an eye out for a test of the September highs. And if we get a multiple break there, we could actually move quite a bit higher. We're also seeing that played out in copper prices, highest level since 2014. So there is, from what we can see here, a definite move or a definite demand for commodities. And I think that is driving some of the gains that we're seeing in equity markets at the same time. Investors are pricing in the prospect of higher demand, just pushing prices higher. Obviously, the weaker dollar is not helping, and that's helping push equity markets higher as well over optimism about the global growth outlook going forward. Now, I said I'd look at Canada Yen. I will look at Canada Yen. Let's see if I can find it. And we can try and establish why Canada is declining against the Yen when oil prices are um, pushing higher. Well, looking at that, I don't think it's too hard to understand why it's broken out. We've broken below those lows that we saw at 89.62. It's been in a range for quite some time, so we've probably seen a little bit of stop loss selling going on here. 90.47, 89.62. So that's around about, um, it's just around about 100 points. So we look as we're probably going to head back down to around about 88.62 on the basis of this move lower. In the overall scheme of things, it's probably going to take us back to around about this series of lows through here. As for a fundamental driver, I, it's hard to say what would be driving uh, that Canada Yen move lower. Let's look at the dollar CAD to see if we can derive any clues from that. And again, with the dollar CAD, the Canada is slightly weaker, the dollar's stronger. Probably going to head back towards this trend line resistance from the May peaks that we saw all the way back at around about 138. So this looks to me a little bit of a technical move in Canada Yen more than anything else. A triggering of stops on a breakout of that range that we've been in for the past few weeks. I can't really think of any other reason as to why the Canada Yen would have dropped apart from the fact that we've had a bit of a technical breakout of the recent range. Okay, what else have we got to keep an eye out for this week? We've got China, we've got some more China data coming out on Wednesday, third quarter GDP. That's likely to come in around about 6.8%. We've obviously also got the Chinese Communist Party Congress, and we could get some indications as to whether or not President Xi will look to continue his crackdown on corruption and what his five-year plan is for the Chinese economy going forward. Certainly what we've seen thus far from the Chinese economy is a much better economic performance than had previously been penciled in for 2017. And I think that's helping, I think, boost, boost risk assets going forward. Industrial production and retail sales are a, number, a couple of other key indicators that could well um, put light a fire under commodity prices going forward as we, as we look ahead to the rest of the week. Here we are. Chinese GDP expecting 6.8%, industrial production 6.2%, retail sales 10.2%. If you want to set alerts for them, just basically select this option here. And just before the alert comes out, um, it will allow you, you can make it a single alert or you can make it a recurring alert. It's entirely up to you. And obviously, it'll only generate that alert when the platform is open. It will pop up on the screen. Obviously, that's three o'clock in the morning, and uh, you'll probably be asleep if you're anything like me um, when that number comes out. But certainly, with respect to any of the other numbers, it's always a very good idea to just select that so that um, 15 minutes before the numbers are due to come out, you'll get an alert to warn you that they're due to come out, and um, it will give you the option of whether or not you want to basically square up your position or, or anything else like that. Um, so that's um, I think um, I think that's pretty much it for this week. Does anyone else have any questions before I wrap this up? Um, if anything occurs to you into the meantime, always drop me a line um, on Twitter 
mhewson underscore cmc at mhewson underscore cmc. Um, otherwise, um, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, I think I'll answer that question offline um, that you just put to me. I think it's slightly more complex um, with respect to the Chinese Xi Jinping put as soon as Congress over. I think I think markets generally are always a little bit concerned about um, unexpected outcomes from these sorts of things. I think in terms of the politics, if nothing much changes, then ultimately I think it's going to be business as usual for the Chinese economy going forward. This is really, I think, a question of President Xi um, reinforcing his power base than anything else, rather than changing policy to a, any greater or lesser extent. Um, so I think that, for me, is the key takeaway that I'll take away from the Chinese Communist Party Congress. It'll be Ch President Xi reinforcing his power base by bringing in his own people. Um, I mean, most of the people that he's got there are his own people, but it'll be reinforcing that power base so that he can be a little bit more radical in implementing any further reforms. Um, anything else ladies and gents otherwise thanks very much for listening and um, have a good week and um, we'll speak to you all the same time same place next week. <laughs>